This is Mary Jo Salter, and I'm going to be reading a poem called Concerto Number no. One for Hearing Aids. You'll hear a few pauses in the middle of lines. Concerto Number no. One for Hearing Aids. Walking out of the doctor's floorboards creaking, squeaking rubber soles, then rough macadam parking lot pebbled, evidently newly, the crunch of crumpled papers in her purse until she found by feel the key ring, lifted, jingle bells, wow, a whole percussion section, pressing the fob, the door lock pop, ear popping, slam the door, shut not, meaning to, said sorry, to nobody but herself, said, stuff again, to hear that person talking loudly, tinny, hollow but tinny, and what a fuss budget, dotting the I, crossing the T, enunciating as if her listener were some sort of dimwit, herself then, turned the key in the ignition, and the radio was on and violins on the classical station. Violins were treble. And how long had music, things, been out of whack? Too much, too muffled, dark, and sorry. Treble was young. Treble was what she'd had when she couldn't hear yet what the world would sound like being old. A new thought. Think of that. The next poem is called The Mailman. Here comes the mailman. I mean the letter carrier. The gendered term was neutered by some clever ad person with one foot in anachronism, since nobody writes letters. And yet our mailman is a living, panting exemplar of hard copy, large as a mountain climbing another mountain as he heaves himself up our uneven stone front steps and jams the environmentally unfriendly, unwanted catalogs into the slot. All the time talking, loud. That's what I'm saying, he's saying. The earbuds nestled in his ears, listen and nod. I've always wondered who's in there, his wife, his brother, a good, I'm sorry, I messed up. I'm gonna back up. All the time talking, loud. That's what I'm saying, he's saying. The earbuds nestled in his ears, listen and nod. I've always wondered who's in there, his wife, his brother, a few good friends on call perpetually to murmur the things you say to someone fired up all day. When he had COVID for two months during lockdown, almost died, his mild replacement told us. I felt sorry I'd never asked his name. His name is Kevin, and if he spots me through the window, always smiles and waves, though he can't stop to talk. To me, that is. He's otherwise engaged. That's what I'm saying. He and I are persons, almost outdated, not quite finished saying whatever it is, some burning, urgent thing. Here's a poem called Vaccine. I remember when they jabbed her hard through her little thigh. It made me cry. Now it's her turn to bear her baby's turn, to take it in that she can't win. She has to do what hurts and not explain and never have the words, though she has plenty, though all new parents say new words all day. And this poem is called Reflections. There he was, or in any case, an image on my laptop of his real-time self, 
five hours later in England, but also here and now, peering at us from his computer screen and about to bend his head to an unseen novel on his desk to read aloud to a virtual audience of writers, many of whom had struggled that same day to conjure at our screens a thing that's true about living, in words true as we could find. A few scenes from Atonement. I had read it twice before, had seen the movie. Now, in a live stream of a graying, mild man reading his novel with commentary, I heard him say that the headstrong teenage writer, Brienne, who in the book would spend her life to come, atoning for one grievous wrong by writing this book itself, one with a happy ending that unhappily was all made up, was not always meant by him to be the author. It came to him midway, part of the process. Ghostwriter, that's what he'd become and even willed for himself to appear to disappear. Or that's what I was thinking at the moment 50 minutes in, when finally I saw what had been mirrored all along within the night sky framed behind his head. Our heads like moons confined to bluish squares. His monitor's reflection in the window, blocked partly by the shadow of the body who sat before it, proved I was in England gazing at me here, however blurry. Infinite fictions, yet time for only one last question. Mr. McEwen, someone asks, what do you think you've learned of what it means to be sorry, to atone? A thoughtful answer emerges, touching on Henry James, James Joyce, the examined life. You can't call back the deeds, the author says. And pious self-forgiveness, he tends to think, is too easy a way out. He pauses, offers a smile that reads as rueful. All you can do is contemplate, reflect. <laughs>